me to tell the church. Because the thing with, with us and our faith is that we hear so much preaching that we become sort of spiritual, you know, people who are just full with a lot of words. But we haven't really, we hear it, but we haven't heard it. And nothing has changed in our lives. We are consistent in being inconsistent. And I want to encourage us. I want to challenge us. I want to provoke us this morning about our faith. About our faith. And last night I was looking at my words again and I was looking and God has a wonderful way of doing things at time. Sometimes I spend weeks when I've been invited. I know what I'm going to be doing next year, June, July, November. I know. It's in my diary already. I know where I'm going to be. I just had to change my date. We were supposed to be in January in Trinidad and Jamaica. Now I've got to be in Ghana. So I know I'm, so I'm preparing. When I get an invitation, I'm thinking about things. I'm saying, God, what is it you want me to say? I don't want to just talk, but I want to be prophetic. I want somebody to be challenged. I want someone to be stirred. I want someone to really understand God's purpose and intention for their lives. So this morning as I was sitting here, I came intentionally early. I went to pray because I recognized that, listen, we do need to hear from God. Listen, the first thing I want you to remember is this. God is not a God of activities. He's a God of receptivity. Did you hear that? Yes, sir. God is not a God who is doing all sort of things. Activities. But he's a God of receptivity. You know, there's nothing worse than when you're trying to tune into a program and it's on and you want to hear it and you can't hear it. It's frustrating. It's annoying. You want to beat the instrument up. You want to... Mm. And so often, we as Christians, we're moving and we're moving and we're moving and we're not hearing from God. We're doing the things we want to do. We're going to where we want to go. We're saying what we want to say. So I want you to this morning to try and tune in to God, regardless of the morning or yesterday, regardless of your circumstances and situation, you are here. We are here to receive a word from God. We want God to give us something that we could chew over lunch, we could chew over, reflect on tonight, we could ponder over it for this week, and we could hear from God in terms of us personally in our lives. In in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus had a discussion with his disciples. He's always having discussion with them. He's doing things that they don't understand. He broke bread and he he spoke to them about the Pharisees and yet they're thinking about something else. Sometimes it's pretty hard to get it as Christians. It's pretty hard to get what God is saying. That's why it's important to wait upon God. Pastor announced that you got a a 5.30 prayer meeting every Monday morning. Um, We have a 5 a.m. meeting every Monday morning. For the last nearly 30 years, I've been meeting with a guy just up the road. We've been meeting together from 6 to 7 every Tuesday morning, unless we've both traveled for the last 30 years, trying to hear from God. We meet now at 6.30 every Tuesday morning over the phone. God wants consistency. God is not a flimsy God. He, he sees this and he sees that and he jumps there and he jumps there. God is a God who's a consistent God and God wants us to be consistent. So for 30 years nearly, I've been meeting with Neil and we've been praying together. Every Tuesday morning, so Monday from 5 to 6, every Tuesday morning from 5 to 6 again, I meet with the bishop and we pray together every Tuesday morning. Okay? One of the week through the month, we meet together from for Monday to Sunday at 5 to pray until 6 or 6.30 to pray. Because I want to hear from God. I want to be receptive, tuning in to God. 
I want to hear what God is saying for me. I want to hear it. For many years, my wife and I were planning to leave England. For many years, we said, we're going to leave this country. I came to this country in 1965. Okay? 1965. I celebrated my 65th birthday on the 4th of July this year. On the 25th of July, I celebrate 41 years of marrying to my wife, Louise. Okay? Because I believe that God is a God of consistency. And it's really interesting because we've said many, some years ago, maybe 20 odd years ago, 30 years ago, we wanted to leave. 35 years, we want to leave this country. And God said, you're not going there. We were in church one morning and the prophet came, a guy that I really respected and nobody knew our plans. We said, when our children finish university, we're going to go. We're going to go either to Ghana or we're going to go to the Antigua, but we're going to go so we could, if we're in Antigua, we could go to North America and go off to Asia. If we're in Ghana, we could come here. Um, We could go into Europe, etc. We were going to go. We're sitting in the meeting and a prophet came and he said to me, Les, Louise said, you've been planning to, to go, but God says not to go, to stay. You could go and come, but you're not to go. Our our plan just went like that, that morning. It's about hearing from God. It's about hearing from God. Our plans just change. And let me tell you something. Had I gone, there are many things that I've done and, and been involved in that would not have happened because I was out of the will of God. Some of you need to hear that. You're up and down like the grand old Duke of York. You know, you know that chorus that we sing? Oh, the grand old Duke of York. He had 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of the hill and marched them down again. And when they're up, they're up. And when they're down, they're down. And when they're halfway up the hill, they're neither up or down. <laughs> you know, there are many Christians like that. One minute they're up, they're in the spirit, they're speaking in tongues. They're on fire for God. The next minute they're down, pastor, the devil's on my back. I'm, I'm struggling. I lost my boyfriend, her pastor. The next minute they're nowhere. They're undercover. 007, license to do nothing. <laughs> Come on. Come on. You see, when we're hearing from God, when we're hearing from God, God speak to us. We are consistent. One of the characteristics of a strong Christian is that not only are they consistent, but they are persistent. They are men and women who are breakthrough people. Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the situation, regardless of the things that they face, they're holding on. They're pushing through. They are not looking down, but they are looking up to the Lord. Because as the psalmist says, I would look unto the hill from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. My help cometh from the Lord. Not tic-tac, it comes from the Lord. Who made the heavens and the earth. We need to learn and understand that when you and I come to faith, we come to Jesus. Jesus who is the king of kings, who is the Lord of lords, who is the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's faithful. He's consistent. He's committed to you and I. Hear what the scripture says. He's able to keep that which we have committed unto him against that day. So here's Jesus talking to his disciples. Who does man say that I am, the son of man? In Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the prophets. But who do you say I am? And then Peter. Note note this. Peter gets a revelation. He hears from God. And in the midst of all this global communication and all these voices, we need to hear from God. Never mind what the WhatsApp says, the guy from the WhatsApp who's the doctor, the specialist. Never mind who's those false prophets who are prophesying lies. You've got to hear from God for yourself. Come on. 
So many Christians are so gullible in the 21st century. Every garbage we take in, everything we hear, we fix it in our minds and our hearts and it messes us up. Who does man, who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the, the son of the living God. Come on. And it's this Jesus that we've got to get to know. This Jesus. This Jesus who walked on Galilee. This Jesus who raised the lame. This Jesus uh, who fed the thousands. This Jesus who delivered those in demonic situation. This Jesus. This Jesus who went into Gethsemane and cried to the Father, if not my will, but your will be done. This Jesus uh, who walked that road up to Golgotha and hung on the cross and died for us. This Jesus uh, that went into the depths of Haiti and it wasn't possible for Haiti to hold him and he was raised up from the dead. This Jesus uh, who was raised from the dead and was seen amongst men. This Jesus who has ascended into heaven and this Jesus who will come one day again for us. Yes, sir. That's the Jesus we're worshiping. He's no phony. He's consistent. He's real. He's doing things. He's changing, transforming lives, communities, cities, and nations. He's doing a work. He's been revealing himself to men and women throughout the century. And he's cons consistently being consistent to reveal himself and his will and his purpose to men and women. And then Jesus says something to him. You are Peter, Petra. You are Peter. That small little pebble but I will build my church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. That's what the church means, the called out ones. God has called us out from darkness. God has called us out from unrighteousness. God has called us out from living a fleshly, worldly life. He's called us out, the called out ones. And he's called us into his kingdom, into his purpose, into his will into his kingdom. God has called us. And I will be my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, when I became a Christian, it was interesting because one of the first reactions I had was my, from my father. And I was going to church and I'm going to just share a bit as well about my conversion because I want you to understand that when God picks up someone and God saves someone, he not only fills them with his power, with his spirit, but he gives them the authority to live and to be consistent. Come on. And so my father said to my sister, where's Les going every Sunday morning? Like that. He noticed, you know, um, I wasn't this guy... You know, I was going to church. I was now wearing a suit and a tie, right? And I um, said, where's he going? He said, he's going to church. And he laughed. Huh. Going to church. He's going to look for women now. <laughs> that was my father's reaction. I'm going to church to look for women. He didn't believe me. He was skeptical. But let me just tell you something. Rewind. The God who is building his church... He is building a church from every nation, from every tongue, from every tribe under the heavens. This morning, for the very first time, people, thousands, globally, millions, are coming into the kingdom of God today. So whether they're in Nigeria, Benin, Togo, whether they're in Senegal, whether they're down there in Calabar, wherever they are, Ghana, you know, they're there five hours later in Antigua and six hours in Jamaica and the Caribbean. People for the first time are coming to know Jesus. Doctors, lawyers, accountants, police officers, politicians, uh, gunmen, you know, drug dealers, prostitutes, nurses and doctors, people from all walks of life are coming to know Jesus today for the very first time. Down in Australia, people have already come into the kingdom for the very first time. In New Zealand and Papua New Guinea, people have already come into the kingdom of God. Heavens have been rejoicing all day because of people who are coming into the kingdom of God. I will build my church. 
The church is not a denomination. It's not a label. The church is people. You and I, we are the church. Here the Bible says, it's Christ in us. Jesus in us. The hope of glory. Jesus in us. So wherever we have this church, there is Jesus. Wherever we gather, there is Jesus. He's there. He's there. So it's incredible. The first time that I really heard the voice of God, guess where that was? The first time. The first time I hear the voice of God. You know where I was? I was in a nightclub in Wardour Street. A nightclub. 3.30 in the morning. I had a big split in my hand. Coming back from the bathroom and I heard a voice. You don't belong here. The question is, what's God doing at 3.30 in a nightclub? <laughs> Some of you think you're the only one who goes to a nightclub. God is there as well. Come on. I was in a nightclub with a split in my hand. And I knew I wasn't that block up, right? <laughs> and and God, was, God spoke to me the very first time that I heard. I didn't know. I heard a voice. Now, the sound system was pumping. This thing is tame. <laughs> what I was listening to, man, you know, you know, down the road. You know, I tell people one difference between black people and white people. White people are selfish with their music. They have Walkman on. <laughs> black people, man, when you hear them, you can hear them for miles. You ever notice the black cars? When a black guy comes down, and this is not stereotyping, okay? When a black guy comes down, you can hear his beat. Whether he's in the jungle or whether whatever music he, you can hear him. You say, here he comes. And when he passes, your heart is beating. If you have ulcer, they begin to shake. <laughs> Come on, we like our music. You know, we're a race of people, cultural people that love music. And so it was interesting. I was in that place. God spoke to me. I couldn't figure it out. And let me tell you guys, God is speaking to you. You may not be able to figure it out, but God is speaking to you. God is saying something to you this morning. God is trying to get through to you this morning that he wants to change and transform your life. He wants you to be faithful. He wants you to be committed. He wants you to be consistent in your life. He doesn't want your life to go up or down and like this in balance. He wants it to go on a trajectory that says I'm making progress every day. I will get some setback, but you're going to push back and you're going to go on and make progress. Amen. That's the God I'm dealing with. That's the God who's trying to get through to you this morning. The second time God speaks to me, there was Sunday afternoon. Every Sunday afternoon, I used to meet with my friends. And we used to meet in a place called Primrose Hill, just opposite London Zoo. Just in Camden Town, not far from the Roundhouse venue. And we used to meet in the house and we used to smoke what we used to call a chalice pipe. If you're from the Caribbean and you know about Rastas, you'll know about chalice. If you're not, you know, I don't know why you, why you know about it, okay? But, you know... <laughs> But we used to there be smoking and licking this pipe. And, you know, I'm on my way there, I met a Christian guy, a guy that I knew from school. And this guy was a witness. And I want to, you know, get some time just to just talk to you a little bit about being a witness for Jesus. That's another sermon. If you're a Christian and you're born again, there's something about you that wants to share Jesus. Wherever you are, you want to share Jesus. There's something about you. Now, you're not one of these nutters who go around beating people up and telling them that they're going to hell. Come on, give me a break. If someone is sick, you don't have to tell them they're sick. You need to talk about healing. If someone is dead, they don't want to tell you. They don't want to hear you talk about death. They want to hear you talk about life. Come on. Come on. We need to be a witness for Jesus wherever we are, wherever. I was on the um, 11th floor of New Scotland Yard and I was there with some senior police officers and we were talking and, um, and I was there. And I know I'm not there just to you know, hang out with the big boys. I'm there for purpose because I'm a kingdom man. I take Jesus to these meetings. Jesus is not in my bedroom or he's not in the car. He's with me. And I'm in that meeting. I'm, we're talking about cohesion and all kinds of things in London. And I said, God, come on, give me a word in this situation. I said, God, give me a word. You may be with your MD. You may be with your CEO. But let me tell you something. God could use you when you know who you are. Yes, sir. Come on. 
When, when you know who you are, when you have confidence in the gospel, when you have confidence in Jesus, it doesn't matter who you are, or where you're with, you know who you are. And I said, hey, I said, chairman, can I say something? He says, Reverend, please say something. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, I said, I know that some of you have no faith, some of you have other faith, but I want to tell you this. Thank you for what you're doing in the city of London, complex city. I want to tell you this. I'm praying for you and your families that God would help you, that God would protect you. And before I sit down, I want to pray for you all. Come on. I'm a minister. I'm a Christian. I'm not a secret agent. 007 license to do nothing. I'm professional. I'm good at what I do. But I'm a Christian. I don't park Christianity in my faith this morning and leave it here till I come back next week. And I prayed for them. And when I finished, one of the senior officers said to me, Reverend, it would appear that you do believe, you do believe what you preach. Thank you. Thank you for that. You see, that's how God works. God takes us up and speaks to us. So there am I now, going back to the thing, I'm, I'm in that place and I'm meeting this Christian guy and he's talking to me about Jesus. A Christian guy. He says to me, Jesus loved me. I said, Lego that boy, where I deal with? <laughs> Just for the benefit of those of you. No, it's not Yoruba or Igbo, okay? This is Patwa. <laughs> Yaman. Say Yaman. <laughs> yeah, all of you speak in Patwa now. <laughs> and he, he said to me, Jesus. Now I had some problems with Jesus. I had some problems. You see, I had a problem with Jesus when I was nine. I went to church, and when I went to church, you know, and I looked up in church, I saw this Jesus. He was white hair, white, blonde hair, blue eye. And I said, how come Jesus with that white hair, blonde eye, blue eye, hate people like me, and they're trying to beat me up? How come my Jesus I serve look like the people who hate me? I had a whole heap of questions. A whole heap of questions. So when this guy is telling me about Jesus, I said, let go that boy, where I deal with? Jai Rastafari. I said, what are you talking about? Forget that man. I'm dealing with Jerry Rastafari. Okay, come on. Come on, I'm dealing with that. And again, that's another issue because, you see, if we're going to be good witnesses and, and dynamic Christians, we're going to be informed about those issues that are hitting our young people, that are making our young people say, I don't want to get involved. When our young people are more enthusiastic about Black Life Matters than they are about Jesus in the church, We've got to get out there and explain these things. I dismissed this guy. And I went to my place and we were all there in a circle. We were smoking. And while we were beating drums and smoking, you know what happened? The Spirit of God was speaking to me. Come on. While I was smoking weed, right, and beating drums, this guy quoted a scripture to me by the, from the book of Proverbs. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but that the end thereof are the ways of death. He spoke a word to me from the Bible, and that word went with me into that smoking room and into that room of you know, smoking ganja and meditation. And God, through his spirit and his word, was convicting me. That's how God works. He's building his church. He's changing lives. That was God speaking to me. I was still resisting God. I was living with my girlfriend. I was living with my girlfriend and God challenged me. Not a church, not a Christian, I haven't been to church. I'm a Rasta and God challenged me. Living with your girlfriend is wrong. I will deal with you with that. I said to my girlfriend, hey, I can't live with you no more. She said, you're crazy. Come on, that's how God works. God convicts people of sin and of unrighteousness. Listen, listen, as long as you begin to share Jesus and live Jesus, don't tell people, leave him and don't do that this and, you know, forget that. Just deal with Jesus. Let God do the work in people's lives. Apart from that guy, no one had preached to me. In that club, it was God. That guy was God, but God came to me and said, hey, Sort yourself out. I said to Carol, I've got to move out. 
Can't live with you no more. It was nearly a year before I went to church. It was nearly a year before this Nigerian guy who was studying theology in London for three years, studying theology for three years, three weeks before he was due to go back to Nigeria, he met me. Divine encounter. You see, when Jesus says he's going to build his church, he was saying to Peter and the disciples, listen, you're my church. And through you, many will know the kingdom of God. Many will come to know truth. And as the truth shall set them free. Jesus says, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and I'm the way. It's through us. We are the church. We are the vessels of Jesus. Jesus, the Bible says, is Christ lives in us. Is Christ in us the hope of glory. But we've got to hear Jesus. We've got to allow him to lead us. We've got to be bold, we've got to be passionate, we've got to be committed. We've got to be men and women who are in tune with him and hearing his voice. The day that this brother met me, it was the day I was planning to kill my father. My father and I had a serious argument the day before. We eyeballed each other, I said, Dad, I'm harassed, I don't believe in violence, but I'll kill you if you do that again. And the next day I was going to purchase a machete and I was going to take it home with me. And as I walked into my dad said I was, I was willing to chop him up and to kill him. I knew I was going to go to prison, but that was it. But that very day, that Nigerian pastor, that Nigerian Christian, there was an encounter and he shared. I asked him, I said, tell me about Africa. He didn't tell me about Africa. He told me about Jesus and the cross. So from the club to the park to my girlfriend, now this guy was opening scriptures and telling me about Jesus who died for my sin on the cross. Listen, he wasn't half an hour. He wasn't two hours. He was about 10 minutes. That afternoon, as I walked home, that afternoon, God began to speak to me again. I loved you. My son died for you. Not Selassie. My son died on the cross. It was his blood. These are the things I was hearing. Three days later, I went on my knees and said, God, I don't believe in this white man God, but if you're real, help me, save me. In my bedroom. That's what God is good. Do you know how many people in their home now are crying out for God? Do you know how many people across this nation are saying, now God, please help me? And today, if you're not a Christian, you could say the same thing. God, have mercy upon me and help me. And let me tell you something. From that moment, I went to my wardrobe and I got the ganja out and I threw it through the window. I went to my uncle and I said, cut this locks off. I don't need dreadlocks to say who I am. I've got a new identity. It's not in my dreadlocks. It's not in my blackness. It's not in my history. It's in now in Jesus Christ. Come on. Come on. And so what I'm saying to you this morning is this. If God has changed your life and transformed your life, he wants to do something in you and through you. If he has done that i never forget on the sixth floor of this block of flats where I live. I said, God, I want you to help me to communicate this gospel. And I want to start right here in my backyard. I want to start right here in the city of London. I want to start right here. Sometimes people get converted and they go to church and then they get caught up. Who am I going to marry? You know, who's my boyfriend? Who's my girlfriend? I said to God, God... I want to know you first. I don't want boyfriend. I don't want girlfriend. I want to know you. I met with people who are serious. I didn't want to walk with flimsy people. I didn't want to walk with people who are looking about how they look and what wig they have on and what shoes they're wearing. I wanted people who wanted to pray, people who wanted to fast, people who wanted to see God. Those are the people I wanted. And I found them. And they taught me to pray and to fast and to wait on God. 
They taught me to wait on God. They taught me to, you know, provoke me to read scriptures. They taught me to live right and to walk before God. And if you do that, hear what the Bible says, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. I went to church, and when I went to church, I, I saw this young lady, and um, I said, Lord Jesus, I said, help me, Lord. I was praying, and I looked down, and, and I saw, and, I, and my heart began, boom, 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 boom. I said, Jesus, I want to keep looking to the cross. <laughs> Some years later, I proposed to her at, at university, and we're married. We've been married 41 years, the best thing, the best thing that's ever happened to me, or oh, the second best. The second best. First is Jesus. Second best is her. Third best is the grandchildren. No. <laughs> God is good. Come on, that's what he does. When you and I put God first, he looks after you. He knows the right man for you. He knows the right woman for you. He knows where you need to live and where you're not supposed to live. He knows the job that you need to pursue. He knows the career that you need because all of these things are going to make you what he wants you to be. Come on. Come on, that's what God does. I didn't know I was going to found an organization and lead it for 30 years and and step aside and do something. I didn't know that all these kind of things were going to happen. I'm always amazed with the things. You know, one of my teachers, Dr. Ocon, came and taught me. And he, when he came to my school, he said, Isaac, you're no good. You're an underground mafia. You know those Niger's teachers. You know, they're strict, disciplinarian. Come on. Six, seven years later after school and he went to the library and he looked at my book and he read it. And I met him. I was going on a training course. And he said, huh. I see that something has happened to you. I said, yes, sir, Jesus. I said, yes, sir, Jesus has come into my life. If anyone's in Christ, the Bible says, he's a new creation. The old things are past, and behold, all things becomes new. I'm building my church. Listen, I don't want to be one of those Christians that just go to church and all flaky and emotional. I want to be solid. I want to be strong. I want to be consistent. And I ask God every day, I want to keep me strong. Keep me faithful. Keep me consistent in my life for you, God. That's what the kingdom is about. Jesus is building his church. And let me tell you something. As I travel, I meet young men and women, some of them in their 20s, or some of them in their 30s. And let me tell you, God's grace and anointing is upon them and they're doing great things. When I see you young people, I hope you're not just coming to church and just sitting back and saying, let the pastors do it. I'm hoping you're saying, God, use me. Help me to be a blessing to the kingdom, to the house, to the family. Use me, God, in a way that God, it'll be a way that I could never imagine. That's, that's God. That's what God wants. To use us. And God uses us anywhere. I was on a plane, I was going to Los Angeles to preach, and we got on this plane, and it was interesting. You know, there are some people always looking for bargains at the airport in duty free, you know that? Listen, there's nothing, no bargain in the airport. You imagine we go to Primark, right? There's no bargains, it's all a fake. They make money from you. Oh, let me have your ticket. No, 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 okay? So, you know, there are some people always looking for bargains, so they're late. You sit on the plane, and say, oh, we're just waiting for two passengers. And then you see some people running. Have you ever been on a flight when they're, like, they're just running? You know, the auntie's coming with six bags, you know. And, you know she, <laughs> <laughs> huh? I was on this plane, I was going, and there were some people coming, and, you know, there was four people who came late, and I was just hoping I was going to have a spare seat beside me, you know, want to stretch out, because I had an 11 hours flight. And um, this, you know, this guy came and this lady came. And this lady walked in and man, she looked stunning. How did I know? I saw her. <laughs> you know, come on guys, get real. <laughs> and she came and sat right beside me. So I said, ra ba 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 <laughs> So I said, Lord, there is no way this woman could sit beside me for 11 hours 
without me telling her about Jesus. There's no way. You ask my wife, I like to talk, you know, I'm a, I'm a social creature, man. I just, I just meet people. So we got in the, she was there, fastened the seatbelt, and we took off, and, you know, they give you these little snacks, don't they? And I say, hey, look, man, forget the little snack, just bring the chicken, come, you know? <laughs> I just wonder why they do all these things, you know? Anyway, she was there, and, but while she sat down, the Lord told me something. I had a word from the Lord about her. You see, when you're moving in God, yeah. God speaks to you. God speaks to you. God gave me a word about this woman. A word of knowledge about this woman. And so we were talking and we talked about politics, you know. We talked about, you know, sociology. We talked about all kinds of things. And, you know, now this woman's a white woman, right? And I know she's thinking, this black guy, this black guy, you know, who is he? Where is he going? What job does he do? You know, because in our society, we look at people and we say, hey, which college did he, you know, go? You know, where does he live, you know? What work does he do? And she was there. We were just talking. We were having fun. She said, uh, you're funny. And then she says to me, four hours into the flight, let me teach you something. When you meet people, don't just knock them over the head with a four-by-four four Bible. You put people off, man. You know this Christian, get saved. Give me a break. <laughs> Let me develop relation, friendship with people. Let people know that I'm real. Come on. Some Christians are too serious. They're boring. They're not on earth. Listen, I'm not in heaven yet, you know. Come on. So, you know, we got to live, we got to have pain. We know we, we are funny, we, we have got all kinds of things here because we're still here. And we were talking, and she said, and what job do you do? I said, yes. <laughs> because I knew that was my cue to begin to tell her about Jesus. So I said, man, I said, hey, my wife says I'm a professional layabout. She, said, she laughed, she, oh, you're funny. <laughs> but you see, I knew about her. She didn't know what the Lord told me about her. And then when I said I went, I said I work for the church. She switched on me. I said, back foot. I said, thank God I'm married. Let me tell you something, guys. Never look at a woman to see how pretty she is or what wig she has on. You got to look for something deeper in a woman. Women, when a man come to you and say, what happened, baby? <laughs> Run for your life. <laughs> okay? There are some guys, it's not about the car they're driving on. Tell me. Or the bling. Tell me some. We're looking for more than that. We're looking for depth in a man. Character in a man. Okay? So don't just look from people and look superficially. Look deep. And the deepest you can look is when you're in the spirit. To discern. To discern. And it was interesting, as I was talking to her, we began to talk. And I was able to reveal what the Lord said to me, to her, in a cryptic way. We spoke for about eight hours, non-stop, dialoguing. When we got to the airport, I remember we went to the carousel, we got our bags, and, and, and she said, see you, Les. Have a, have a good time. And, you know, and then when I got my bag, and then she looked back again, and she just waved at me. I don't know if she got saved, but I believe God did something. I believe one day I'm going to meet that woman. She's going to say, do you remember that flight, Les? I said, how could I forget it? God told me something about you, and you look stunning. <laughs> Come on. God does that. God wants to use us. God wants to use you. But if God's going to use you, you've got to give you to him. You've got to be receptive to him. You've got to allow him to speak to you. You've got to allow him to empower you. You've got to allow him to lead you. And as you do that, your life will be fruitful. It will be dynamic. It will be adventurous. 
it will be a life that is fulfilled in God. At our age, my wife and I, we've been talking and we, we've had some people who have died, some very good friends, close people. We lost one of our, my, our dear son a couple of months ago and um, it was painful for us as a family. And so, you know, and in my job, I have to speak to many families about death and bereavement and trauma. And, you know, I said to my wife, honey, listen, the reality is one day I will die. All the statistics says that I'm going to be first and you'll be second. I said, honey, when I die and I have a funeral, you know, Christians, every Christian want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> right? Everybody wants to meet Jesus. <laughs> okay? And um, I said, honey, when I, when, I, when I go, I said, Donnie, you know, when my coffin's there and you're there in the front row, please cry a little bit for me. Let the people know you love me, you know? Just a little. But if you cry too much, I'll get up. <laughs> Come on. You see, when we are Christian and we have Jesus in focus and we complete his will, we become like Paul. Do you remember? You know, Jesus, first of all, Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. Paul says, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've run the race. Hence, there's laid up for me a crown. He said, I'm betwixt two minds, whether to stay or whether to go. There's something about when we do what God has to us to do, we feel comfortable with whatever happens to us. Is that okay? Yes, I want to challenge you now. I want to really challenge you. You need to be hearing from God. How do we hear from God? We meet with a five o'clock prayer meeting and we seek God. Let me tell you something. You don't just bounce into God's place and bounce out again. There's order. Okay, there's protocol. You know, God is not like McDonald's or KFC. Drive through. Uh-uh. God is not like that. There's protocol. First of all, a clean hands, a pure heart, and a right spirit when we come before God because no one will see God. We don't just bounce into God like that. But the more we pray, the more we seek God, the more we ask God to set us apart, sanctification. The more God ministers to us, deals our heart. And when we pray, as we go into prayer and as we worship, and as sometimes we speak in tongues, but we pray, God begins to speak to us as his servants and he begins to order our footsteps and he begins to protect us from all those things that would seek to distract us and he begins to guide us and to direct us and our lives become fruitful and dynamic is that what you want yes, sir. is that what you desire yes. I want to pray for you I want to pray that God would help you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God will take you up and that you will know the leading and the steps of the Lord, that you will know the power of God in your life. Last week we were sitting down, I was just trying to watch the news, I had my, you know, my dinner in my hand and we were sitting down and my phone rang and it was a call from Canada and it was a a young, he's a young man, he was a youth, he was in our church, he was in my church as a pastor, he was a young guy, and him and his wife was on the phone to me, and he says, we want to thank you both. You taught us so much. We are what we are because of your ministry to us. They've planted a church in Canada. They've seen fruits and success because he said what you taught us, the way you loved us, the way you looked after us, the way you instructed us, we have flourished and we have grown in God. Come on. This is a place that God has brought you to grow, to be nurtured, to, be, to flourish, and to grow and to grow until he leads you into his will and his purpose. This is a place. This is home. This is your spiritual home where you're nurtured. Those gifts and talents are being cultivated where you're taught how to hear, how to listen, how to be obedient, how to be sensitive to God, how those things that so easily beset you can be, you can be broken from and grow in God. I want to pray for you. 
I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God will take you up and minister to you and use you according to his glory and use you according to his power and his purpose. When I was sick last year, you know, two of the people that came to visit me was two young girls. One of them, I married their parent and she came, she's a young lady, she's a school teacher, she came and she listened to me, talked to me, and then she came and laid hands on me and asked God to heal me and hasten me. I was in tears because one of my daughters was doing that. They live in Luton. Another one came and they, she was talking to me, encouraging me, and praying for me, and she tells me about she's doing this in Brazil, and she takes people to Brazil, and she works in the Amazon. These are people who have grown, have heard God, and listened to God, and who are fulfilled in their calling and in their lives, and Jesus is using them to establish his kingdom. Come on.